whatever specialty he one may work, one will come across all these kind of clinical conditions, the ECG, and their opinion will be asked like, can you please have a look about us? Uh, can you please guide us? Uh, what could be the basic problem with that and all? And how can we help? In fact? So I really think this is very important. And that's why we are trying to deal with this topic over here. So, so as the name itself uh, says, the sick sinus uh, syndrome, it actually is consists of a group of heart rhythm problems in which we can understand the sinus node, which is the heart's natural pacemaker, doesn't work properly. And uh, we all are very much aware sinus node is the one which tends to not only form but also help for the propagation of the electrical pacemaker, okay, uh, which tends to happen especially in our heart. So there are a lot of problems. So can anyone recall what are the common problems, for example, at least these kind of patients, they do come to us. So for example, uh, what are the clinical symptoms for the presentation, I would say? Please feel free to use the chat box, I would suggest. Okay, okay, I can see some responses. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so indeed, so a few people have already smartly said it to me, uh, the, like, yes, there will be problems, uh, in fact, in terms of uh, shortness of breath, dizziness, loss of consciousness, otherwise a lot of times as uh, lightheadedness can be there as well. A lot of times it could be in the form of uh, dizziness itself and sometimes there are some atypical presentations as well in which uh, the patient just said it like uh, was, uh, the patient was doing all fine. Uh, the only problem was whenever the patient was walking, the patient was having was a feeling of uncomfortableness. So a lot of times it can be a little bit indeed difficult to be able to understand the clinical symptoms, clinical problems on a complete basis, okay? So that's why I say it like this, whenever we are all are dealing with such cases, we should always try to take a good history. So one of the common uh, encounters which we will come across with such patients is in the form of, I would say is, uh, in the form of sinus pause or sinus arrest. Can anyone uh, try to share with me what do they understand by sinus pause or sinus arrest? How, how do they diagnose it? So what do you mean by sinus pause or sinus arrest? Yes. So, see, one of the main reasons I must say what I always like to have is more of interaction. So never think it like this. This is for teaching and all. See, we all are humans. We all will make mistakes. This is how we all tend to learn. So the thing is, let's learn those things right now. Let's l make those mistakes now so that we'll be better off at least in the future. Isn't it? So... Uh, that's why I'm trying to make the format in the form of more and more interaction. Okay, ECG changes. Yes, ECG changes. That's what I will try to focus upon. Okay, no P waves. Yeah, I got one answer. How about others? What do others think?
Anything else? Okay. Yeah. What else can we expect, for example, in the form of sinus pause or arrest? I'm sure uh, you all are exposed to the ECGs and I'm sure you all are even capable of diagnosing those patients as well. So, but what is the common thing? which will happen for such patients. So what tends to happen is, as someone already said it is, yes, there will be transient absence of the sinus P wave on the ECG, which may last from even two to uh, like few seconds, even going up to several minutes as well. One of the longest one I have seen is up to around nine minutes sinus pause. And the guy was the only complaint the patient had was dizziness, I would say. So yes, there may be no arithmetical relationship to the basic, uh, the sinus rate, in fact. So does it ring a bell when we see this ECG? Uh, okay, let me try, because I want to give you guys a full picture. Okay. So if we look carefully in this ECG, we can see those PP intervals, R intervals as well. However, so over here, we notice the PI intervals are fine, right? So this is the double of the PP interval. So this is the P, P. Over here, this is the P, Q, R, S, T wave. P, Q, R, S, T wave. P, Q, R, S, T. And the next P is over here. But what is the difference between this and this over here? So what is happening is, as I was telling is, so if you will be looking carefully at the RA interval, the RA interval will be pretty longer compared to the normal one, okay? And of course, we notice there's no relationship between the cycle length of the pause and also of the intrinsic sinus rhythm. So, the other uh, common rhythm which we all come across is what is the sinus arrhythmia. So in the sinus arrhythmia, as I had already said, it is a lot of times during the inspiratory inspiration and the expiration as well, the R intervals may vary. And a lot of times the small changes in the cycle length will be varying by around up to 120 milliseconds or in the, uh, we can also see it a lot of times in multiples of the PP intervals as well. So for example, what do we notice in this uh, strip over here? So what do we notice over here? Okay. So as we can see it over here, there is not only variation in the cycle length of, in the terms of, you know, the RR intervals or the PP intervals. In fact, we are also able to notice there is a gradual increase or decrease in the heart rate which tends to happen typically with the respiratory cycle. And that is where the heart rate is increasing with inspiration. So a mnemonic which I typically try to use is called as the II. So the heart rate will increase with inspiration and decrease with expiration. Okay. So the other thing as well, there are a lot of uh, other anatomical structures in the heart, which is quite a lot for us to be able to understand how the conduction is happening in the heart. So one of the important pacemakers, literally the generator of the electrical conduction tends to happen in the heart from the sinus node, which is more like a sub epicardial structure, which is there, I would say in a simple uh, imagination, if you can imagine the heart in your memory, 
on the right side on the upper corner. So it is almost pretty close uh, towards the sulcus terminalis. And it has a special cluster of cells which can cause auto depolarization to the rest of the heart as well. And it is such a cell which tends to heavily get affected by the autonomic, autonomous nervous system as well. Uh, so it's a very important thing for everyone to be able to understand what are the genes which is involved for the different components, the different depolarizations which is uh, present. And it's a very important question as well, I must say, uh, which is asked to a lot of the candidates during the different examinations. So this is something very important, uh, but that can be a uh, topic for consideration or to discuss about sometimes later. So as we can see, the sinus node impulse formation and propagation, which is often accompanied by similar abnormalities in the atrium and the conduction system of the heart, it may result in inappropriately slow ventricular rate and long pause at rest during the various stresses. So what happens is a lot of times it can be mild. So if it is mild, of course, so what will happen is the patient may be not so symptomatic. Okay. However, if it is quite a lot, then patient will complain of fatigue, dizziness, confusion, fall, syncope, sometimes even chest pain as well, or the heart failure symptoms and palpitations can also happen. So this is a beautiful diagram. I would really like you to go through this and to be able to understand. So what are the investigations which we all should uh, prescribe or which we all should think for uh, the patient? So one of the important things to keep it in mind for this is like how about the causes for that? So important thing to uh, for us to be able to understand is what are the causes for the bradycardia or even the AV blocks? So we all can understand, for example, the typical causes for the sick sinus syndrome will include the inappropriate sinus bradycardia. As the exit block, sinus mutual exit block. So we will discuss about it again uh, in the coming slides, in fact. And the typical AV blocks, I think uh, you all know about it very well, like the first degree AV block, second degree AV block, third degree AV block, like that, yeah? So, one of the fundamental things uh, we all should never forget is this electrical conduction system. So in the this electrical conduction system, what we all should be able to understand uh, is the relative anatomical position, how is the right atom related to the right ventricle, and of course the left atom related to the left ventricle. And especially it's the relationship the, of the electrical conduction system, as I was telling you, the sinoatrial node, okay, close to the surface terminalis, then comes the atrial ventricular node, later on going in to form the his bundle, and then finally dividing to the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch, and further, the left bundle branch further splitting into the fascicles, okay? So, what are the other common causes which we all can come across uh, whenever we are dealing with these problems? So, what tends to happen is, a typical thing is, uh, as I was telling you, so uh, we will come across patients with sinoatrial node dysfunction in which you will discover there may be inappropriate sinus bradycardia, sometimes the sinoatrial exit block, or even the sinus pause, or what is called as a tachybrady syndrome. So, what is uh, the uh, cause, for example, for the sinus sinoatrial node dysfunction? So, it can cause, there could be a typical thing is like intrinsic causes can be there, extrinsic causes can be there. So intrinsic causes wise, we all are aware that uh, mo quite a lot of those patients who present to us are there in their old ages. So idiopathic degenerative diseases could be there, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy. So if you do come across alcoholic cardiomyopathy or postpartum cardiomyopathy, so cardiomyopathies can also lead to such causes. Similarly, like. Uh, collagen vascular disorders, uh, the scleroderma or inflammatory process like myocarditis, 
or inflammatory uh, or the surgical trauma as well. So, for example, if someone has had a cardiac transplant or some of the cardiac surgeries as well, so then those patients can again have this problem as well. Similarly, the musculoskeletal disorders like the myotonic dystrophy or the congenital heart disease as well. So, for example, if there is a correction, so a lot of times they will be getting stretched as well. So, etiologies wise, there could be quite a lot. And then, similarly, uh, there are it, intrinsic etiologies, similarly, there could be extrinsic etiologies as well. Extrinsic etiologies are the one. I think if someone is there uh, with the patient, one should try to ask the history for. The history will include for, like the medications, is someone on beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or uh, then how about the antiarrhythmic drugs as well. So if someone is having uh, any antiarrhythmic drugs, a lot of times we can come across uh, these patients. So as I had said, it is like a quinidine, flecainid, or amiodron as well, or sometimes like lithium. And a lot of times we may come across these patients who will be having a, under the influence of autonomic influence, like the the high vagal tone or the carotid sinus syndrome or the vasovagal syncope as well. And a lot of times we do come across uh, the problems of uh, electrolyte abnormalities like hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia, or even hypothyroidism as well. So sometimes, uh, can anyone recall what could be the possible causes if uh, we are seeing a patient uh, from our neurology co colleagues are the ones who will be calling us that uh, we think there's some you must put up a pacemaker put up a te temporary pacemaker uh, there's some problem can anyone think of the neuro neurological cause for this so if there is increased intracranial pressure so in cases of some infections which can cause or uh, sometimes even hypothermia as well. Hypothermia can cause uh, problems like this. Or even the sinus node dysfunction, as I had already said it, okay? So, a lot of times we come across these patients, uh, we will be seeing that there is an inappropriate sinus bradycardia or what is called as the chronotropic incompetence. So, what is chronotropic incompetence? I'll try to keep on looking on the chat box as well. So what happens is the uh, there will be bradycardio, of course. So the heart rate will be sixty, less than sixty, which doesn't increase appropriately with exercise. Okay, and uh, so normally uh, it is usually defined as failure to be able to attain. Uh, uh, around 80% of the maximal age predicted heart rate, so MAHR we call it as on exercise testing. Okay, so MAHR we calculate is like this: 220 or target heart rate, 220 minus age. So failure to reach a heart rate of 120, for example, if there is a patient of 70 year old, will be called as chronotropic incompetence. So. Uh, Okay, <laughs> I wanted this ECG for the interpretation for everyone, in fact, but uh, I've already given the answer. So as you may notice, other than, of course, the sinus bradycardia, there are some premature ventricular complexes as well, which is over here around, yeah, which we can notice. So... A sinus bradycardia is also which we all will keep on coming across and we should be aware what is happening in these conditions. So, now you are there, a practical scenario I'll give it to you. So you are there in the accident and emergency department, you get a call, please come over here quickly, you got a fast bleep, okay? by one of your friends or, uh, you know, someone who really needs some help, they have uh, given you a call. 
Now, they already did some measurements and all to be able to help you. So this is what you notice. Anyone would like to guess what is happening over here? Good, good. So I can see Olena, Sean, come on. Omar, Sam. Okay, Sam, uh, if you want, you can unmute yourself and try to explain it to us. Why do you think it is sinus arrest? Or uh, Olena, would you like to try? <laughs> we all are learning, don't worry. My prof used to say, we learn till we die. So let's learn together. Let's learn together. Very good. Okay. So what, so what is... Wonderful, very nice. So indeed, it is sinus pause or arrest, which I had already said it is. It is actually, we see absence of sinus P waves on the ECG for more than two seconds. And there is due to lack of sinus nodal pacemaker activity. Isn't it? Wonderful, I'm really happy. So. Okay. Uh, so, as we had already said it is, we do come across all these problems and we all have to be a bit uh, careful as well. So, what tends to happen uh, in the sinus node dysfunction which we already spoke about? I'll try to give you some example. So, anyone would like to try what is happening in this ECG? I like the interaction part. We all are humans, right? So we all have been blessed how to interact in different ways. Okay, anyone, anyone, anyone? Okay, try to at least make a... What, what do you think? So we already... I'm, I'm a pretty helpful and nice person, isn't it? So I already give you... Clues and all. Okay, someone said it. Okay, Sean. Chop beats. So, so. So what is happening is, it is like a conduction delay between the sinus node and the atrium, which is uh, which can't be recognized on the regular ECG recordings, isn't it? So this is the normal ECG recording, normal ECG recording, normal ECG recording. But over here, so isn't it over here, you notice the difference. So this is what is called as the sinoatrial exit block. Okay? So what about this ECG? Um, does, uh, I'm sure you all will be reading the book, The Hearst. We used to call it literally like the Bible of cardiology. The Hearst, otherwise... Uh, brown vault. I used to love Hearst, I don't know why, uh, even better than brown vault. So, this strip I can never forget. Very important strip, very important to be able to diagnose as well. What is happening over here? So few things uh, I always try to say to everyone, uh, you should be able to filter out the artifacts. So what is happening over here, if you will look carefully, this is a little bit tricky uh, ECG as well. Um, I'm uh, sorry if it's a little bit difficult to understand, but I'm sure if you will start thinking, you will be able to understand. So in the last two beats, so the last beat is like sinus rhythm, isn't it? P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. However, 
before this, there seems like something is there, but these are like artifacts. And how you see it as artifacts? Because you try to look on the other lead as well. You do not notice any deflections, yeah? So this is again QRS, but before this is P wave, something is there. Something again is there. Something again is there. Something again is there. Something again is there. So what is happening? There are a lot of P waves, right? So this is what is, I would call it as a H-well tachycardia. So some tachycardia is happening. Again, over here as well, you see another P wave as well, interposed. And then after that, what do you notice? There's a long pause of around 3.6 seconds. And then the sinus rhythm activity resumes. So this is what is called as a tachycardia, bradycardia syndrome. Yeah. So why did we speak uh, about the tachycardia, bradycardia syndrome as well? So what tends to happen is, uh, as I already emphasized, there will be bradycardia or sinus pauses which will be interspersed with the atrial arrhythmias. I gave you one example of atrial tachycardia. It can ha happen in terms of atrial fibrillation and also in terms of atrial, uh, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia as well. A lot of times, sinus arrest tends to manifest, especially after termination of atrial arrhythmia, either spontaneously or even after DC cardioversion. So, uh, in EP study, how we try to look for this will be is using the sinus load recovery time. Okay, so the same observation, we try to use it uh, during our studies. So, an important condition which comes to all of us is when to pace. So if they now you have come across this patient, you have seen the signs and symptoms, you saw the ECG, what to do? So when do you consider for these patients to be uh, needing any pacemaker? So a typical thing is I always recommend is use the classes of indication, class one, class two, class three. Otherwise like at least the class one indications. So what do you think are the class one indications for the need of pacemaker? So someone having a sinus node dysfunction with documented, documented symptoms, then there is a irreversible cause. Irreversible cause, for example, uh, there is a trifascular block, okay, with symptoms. Otherwise, similarly, uh, someone has to be on essential drug therapy as well. Otherwise, if you came across chronotropic A incompetence, yeah? Then the class three. So uh, what are the class three indications will be is like in which the patients, there's no need for pacemaker. It will be asymptomatic patients, yeah? So as I already said, it is we should try to keep it in mind what are the different reasons for the sinus node dysfunction. There can be slight overlap whenever we are talking about the atrioventricular blocks or as we already spoke about the sinus node dysfunction as well. So the AV blocks, I think you all are getting already exposed to since a long, long time. It could be first degree, second degree. Uh, third degree or even the high grade AV block as well, okay? So what is happening in this ECG? I'll try to give you a practical example. Theory, you all are aware, you all are masters. I think there will be a lot of textbooks as well where you all can go and read about it. So what type of AV block is it? Or is it, what is this ECG actually? What it feels like to you? Think about it, have a look. I'm telling you, what will happen is typically you will be there somewhere. ECGs you can't escape. You can't escape any part of the world any field of medicine or surgery you go, they will do, and the first thing, they will come running to you. Okay. Morbid type 2. Hmm. 
Sam versus Sean. Whom shall I trust? Okay. I like this explanation. Good. Dr. Trussell. So, as he already said it is, what happens if we notice over here, the PR interval definitely is more than 200 milliseconds, yeah? And then what is happening? Yes, we do notice the QRS interval is normal, okay? So, what it means is, it is the level, the block is at the level of AV node. And do remember that if the QRS, uh, you do notice that if there's a bundle branch block, so the block will be in the his Perkins system. So what do you notice? PI intervals are prolonged. Yeah. So it is more than five blocks, if you'll notice over here. Or anywhere, if you'll notice. So definitely, the winner is Dr. Sean Trussell. Wonderful. Well done. So... Regarding management, I think everyone will uh, agree we did not do anything right for such patients. And most of these patients, I would say, they are asymptom asymptomatic. Oh no, I have already given the answer over here. So, so now I'll make the question in the other way. I'm master of putting questions. So my question will be, how to call this ECG as second degree? or Mobitz 1 block. Anyone would like to try? I'm telling you, you can't escape from ECGs. ECG will come and follow you. Okay, Sean. Good, good. I like the explanation. So as uh, one of your colleagues has already said it, so there is progressive prolongation of the PI interval, shortening of the R interval until a P wave is blocked. And the R interval containing the non-conducted P wave is less than those two PP intervals. So in fact, the PI interval tends to be longer after the non-conducted P wave. That's where there is grouped beating. So cause-wise, there could be a lot of causes. It can be sometimes normal as well. Sometimes it can be present in athletes or secondary to some medication. Otherwise, um, myocardial infarctions uh, can also cause Anyone would like to guess what kind of myocardial infarction patients will have such kind of uh, ECGs and why? Good, Olena. Nice attempts, Sri. What type of myocardial infarction you can come across such ECGs? So for the sake of time, I must try to be a little bit quicker. Myocardial infarction of the right atrium. Hmm. Interesting. You're almost there. You're going in the right direction, Olena. You're going in the right direction. So inferior wall, myocardial infarction. So inferior wall, MI. So because inferior wall is supplied by the RC. So that's why... Uh, you have to rule it out. Otherwise, the other causes will include acute rheumatic fever, myocarditis. So these patients may also be asymptomatic. Similarly, as I had already said, it is, yes, if it is a narrow QRS complex, the block is at the AV node, okay? However, if there's void QRS, then the possibility of block below the AV node uh, will happen for such kind of patients, okay? And regarding the management as well, Quite a lot of those patients may not uh, require any further intervention. So what needs to be done is try to find out the cause for that. Try to take away the offending drugs and the patients will do much better. So now about the Mobids too. Okay. 
Oh, uh, yeah. So about the as we, this we have already discussed about it, the management as well. What about the movements too? Patients. What tends to happen in the movements too block? So there will be constant PI interval with an intermittent. non conducted p wave and there is no evidence of a premature atrial complex and the ri interval between those non conducted p waves is equal to two pp intervals and the each qrs is preceded by multiple p waves so for example there could be uh, one is uh, like two is to one blocks but if there is a three is to one block four is to one block you should uh, it is called as literally like a high grade av block there can be other variations as well something like a 3 is to 2 two blocks as well but typically 2 is to 1 block uh, will be morbids 1 or morbids 2 block so what is happening in this ecg i already gave the answer earlier so for the sake of time i need to be a little bit quicker i would like to discuss more so what is happening is so what is happening over here so as you can see there are multiple p waves yeah but in between r waves you didn't see so what is this this is a high grade av block what about this one so the good thing is p waves are already marked because there are a lot of baseline artifacts so simple so it is a 2 is to 1 av block so the other thing i always say it like this not just look at one lead also try to look on the other leads as well so if there is a bump a bump or a hump i would say which you can see it over here on the uh, t waves and that's what uh, will indicate about this abnormality which we can see it over here so this is like a 2 is to 1 wave so regarding the management uh, there is need for only permanent pacing only if patient is symptomatic which is due to high likelihood of progression to high grade av block and third degree av block as well so one of the important things is how to be able to differentiate so we can differentiate in terms of different parameters including the qrs duration so morbids to will be more wider and if uh, there is hr and av conduction if you'll try to see on exercise or atropin the morbids uh, to will worsen okay so if you will so it is very important i would say so a lot of times whenever there is doubt in the morbids one morbids to make them exercise or give them atropin so morbids one will improve however the morbid two is the one which will worsen okay similarly as i had already said it is if uh, uh, you will be doing a carotid sinus massage it will be opposite and i already said it is acute myocardial infarction inferior wall mi is the one which will be happening in for patients of morbid one however morbid two is for the anterior wall am i uh i don't know there has been some mistake <laughs> okay the good thing lucky for you is uh answer is already there in front of you so now i'll twist the question why one will label it as a third degree av block okay good some answers are there how about others okay right good i'm pleased to notice like everyone is going in the 
same direction. So what is happening is we are able to notice fixed AA intervals are there, which is the PPP. Okay, RR intervals are also regular, but what is happening is the atrial and the ventricular rhythms they are independent of each other. So the PR interval varies, the PP and the RR intervals are constant, and what is called as a ventriculophasic sinus arrhythmia. Okay, so the sometimes the ventriculophasic sinus arrhythmia what we notice is PP intervals containing the QRS will be shorter than the PP intervals without a QRS interval. Good. I'm sure you all would have a lot of times come across escape rhythms. They could be in the form of junctional escape rhythm which will be pretty narrow uh, and sometimes can be of course wide as well with a bundle branch block. However, the ventricular escape rhythm could be even uh, wider and and having the heart rate of around 30 to 40 beats per minute okay so what about the causes for this so what are the causes for escape rhythm so myocardial infarction as i have already said it is uh, uh, there could be degenerative diseases or the infective diseases like the amyloid, sarcoid, or even the endocarditis or hyperkalemia or medication or even after the post, after the cardiac surgery as well it can happen. So most of the times you should base such kind of patients if you have come across. Unless or until there is a reason not to base. So anyone would like to guess what is happening? I hope so by now you would have been able to understand what we have been through so far. So these are some quiz sessions. So what do you think is the ECG rhythm in this? What is the rhythm? Otherwise, at least try to see what is happening. So I try to approach any kind of ECG in the form of... Uh, rate, rhythm, axis, then segment voice changes and then you can start thinking like okay what could be the possible causes. So what is happening is it is regular right so leave the first one so this is the good thing is like you will be able to know you know what is the normal rhythm looking like. So as we can see they are regular wide complex rhythm and the heart rate is, yes, the first one was, so one, two, three, four, around four boxes. Around 75 beats per minute. There is AV dissociation. So is it VT? It is not VT. Why? because ventricular that is tachycardia this is a ventricular rhythm is there but it is not even bradycardia yeah bradycardia we always use it for less than 60 heartbeats per minute but the heart rate is like 60 going up to 100 or even 110 as well we can but so this is what is called as the accelerated ventricular rhythm this is mostly like a benign process uh, which can happen even normally otherwise when there is coronary reperfusion Otherwise, sometimes in cases of detoxin toxicity as well. Are there any questions so far? If there are any questions, I would really like, uh, you can please feel free to use the chat box. I guess I did not so bad so far so I always believe in problem oriented learning I did my PhD and also my EP fellowship from Maastricht University Medical Center uh, 
which has been the pioneer for problem-based learning in Netherlands. So that's why, okay, let's go through some more problems as well and what more can we learn or can we apply what we have learned so far. What do you notice in this? So I will try to keep on giving you some hints as well. Anyone would like to try? What is happening in this ECG? Mobits 1. Olena. Why do you think it's Mobits 1? So is that Mobits 1? Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit, uh, I would say, Catchy. So indeed, you got it very right, no doubt, very good approach. So it is getting prolonged, 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 prolonged. But did you see a misbeat? No, you didn't see a misbeat. Isn't it? So later on, so this is going in continuation. I would suggest, so for example, after the last ECG, the, it comes back like the, again the first one. So if you'll notice the first one and the last one, they are almost similar. Isn't it? So this is what is a, like a third degree AV block, but with junctional rhythm. Okay? Now this ECG. What do we notice? I promise you, it's a simple one. So what I mean is exceptions are always there. Always remember, especially in the field of medicine. So you always need to be able to think on a broad basis. What is happening? What could be the reasons? So otherwise, your answer was pretty good, actually, Olena. You had gone pretty good. Yep, Sean had already made a good guess, huh? So what is happening in this one? Okay. Sam, would you like to try? Would you like to try? Why do you think so? Good, exactly, and indeed, you are absolutely right. So we are able to notice a drop beat over here. Very good, very good. Now, how about this ECG? I'm see, I'm such a nice person, isn't it? I've marked all those P waves as well. If it would have been a you know class session, I would have asked you to come and take a scale or make your own measurements, but in virtual class, I can't have that liberty. So that's why I have to be extra nice during these virtual sessions. You know the answer. See, there's a difference between complete heart block, 
Okay? And this entity, I already gave you the example. So, the problem with this entity is indeed, what is happening is, yes, it looks like, you know, PI intervals are getting prolonged, 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 okay? But, however, if we look carefully, PP intervals are constant, RI intervals are constant, and if you may recall about the escape rhythm, what was the... Uh, I would say the key point which I had said it about the diagnosis, especially about the third degree AV block. So, okay. So what happens is it looks like complete heart block, but it is not really complete heart block. And it will go towards fitting towards the junctional rhythm. So that is why what you will call it as so this is third degree AV block with junctional escape or high grade AV block yeah third degree AV block or junctional escape how about this one I had already showed you this tracing actually I want to see how many people were focused during our session. I already gave you this example, isn't it? I'm giving you a little bit of atypical examples so that you will get exposed to it right now. Later on, there will be no problem. So in simple words, there's high grade AV block. No doubt about it. Yes, everyone will agree. Yeah, this is what I had said. It. So you can call it as there's also a junction escape. Uh, a typical clinical question, how you will be assessed, for example, if you are trying to appear from the European Society of Cardiology exam or maybe some board exams as well later on. So 50 year female patient, no past medical history, came with acute onset of shortness of breath on exertion, past four days. So already someone was there, uh, you had a nice, uh, friendly nurse who did the measurements for you, 50 beats per minute, the blood pressure was 140 by 80, initial ECG was done, sinus bradycardia, you did the trop eyes, so it was 1.2. So, not so significantly elevated. So, now you got the ECG. What is happening here? I'll give you a big hint. So this was one of the first ECG which we discussed about. So there's different things which is happening over here. Look at the first few waves and the last few waves. Isn't it? It is looking different. The last four and the initial ones. So what is happening here? There is some escape rhythm, yeah? So this is what is characteristic of the sinus arrest with ventricular escape. So I had already given some of the easy ones during our session earlier. So that's why I wanted you to get exposed to some of the tricky ones as well. Okay, I'll not be a nasty guy now. I'll try to... Okay, yeah, so, right. I'm so glad. 
Uh, Sean had already answered it well. Good, good, Olena. Well done. Good. You guys are doing really well, I must say. Frankly telling, during my IMT days and all, if someone would have asked me these easy things, I would like, oh no. <laughs> So what I mean is, you need to see these ECGs again and again, you will forget. Again you need to see them, then you will forget. Again you will see them, and then you will always remember. So that is a good way to remember, okay? So what is happening in this ECG? Okay, uh, I'm supposed to finish, I'm so sorry. Uh, I always get into So as I had said, it is simple thing is, there's variation in the RR intervals, yeah? PQRST, PQRST, PQRST is there everywhere. So this is what is the? Sinus arrhythmia. So to make this uh, query shorter, you come across this ECG. So the history is 65 year old male patient with four days of history of shortness of breath, and he also feels uh, uncomfortable in his heart. So what do you think it is? This can be a little bit tricky for a lot of people. But worth it. So what do you notice over here? Come on. This is the ultimate test ultimate test of what we have learned today okay sam you're going in the right direction okay for the sake of time now i'll try to finish so what is happening is in the v1 you see these fibrillatory waves so this is not flutter waves yes it looks like it looks like okay but this is too fast don't you notice it is too fast to be flutter wave so it is definitely not a flutter wave so especially if you look in the Whenever you are trying to see for the P waves, to see it more clearly, you should see in the lead 2, otherwise lead V1. I would say this is more like a fibrillatory wave. Yes, it, some way it looks like flutter, but it is fibrillatory, isn't it? Fibrillatory waves, but RI intervals are constant, 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 constant. So what it is? No Olena, no ST elevations. We are talking about arrhythmias. So, RI 